have a literal son, literally, then God must have had a wife, literally. But then most people would say, no, of course, we don't mean God had a literal son. God is not, you know, that such and such is not literally the son of God. It's a symbolic son. But then again, we would still say, what do you mean by that? That God has a symbolic son. Did God adopt someone as a son, for example? So similarly, then we would have to say, what do we mean by that? So, for example, if I brought with me today um, my little rabbit, not my little rabbit, but my kid's little rabbit, um, Smokey, because she's sort of, sort of smoky coloured, and I said, you know, here's Smokey, my son. You'd say, well, you know, Abdurrahim, that's a rabbit. You know, you're a human, that's a rabbit. No, I said, it's my son. You know, she, you know, he eats with us at the table. Um, you know, he's got a bed in the house. The adoption papers are coming through next week due to the new liberal animal adoption laws that we've just had or something. It's my son. But you'd say, look, this is an animal. You're a human. It doesn't mean anything to take an animal as your son. Because you're human. So it doesn't mean anything. You can't adopt an animal as your son because you're not like it. Therefore, if that's true, in, and you may love it like a son, you may love it, and some people do love their animals, maybe even more than their children, right? But the fact is that, no, this is an animal, you are a human. So the distance, the gap between the human being and the animal is less than the gap and the distance between the transcendent creator and the human being. So as it is absurd to say that we are, you know, a rabbit could be my son, or a goldfish, or I don't know, anything like that. Similarly, to claim that a human being who is a small speck on an earth, which is a small speck in a galaxy, which is a small speck, which is one of millions of galaxies in the known universe, which is how many millions of light years across, is the son of God. That's why the Quran says that the heavens are ready to break asunder, the mountains are ready to crumble into ruin, because they say, God has a son. It is a form of shuk, because claiming that God has a son is attributing to God animal creation-like qualities. But God is far removed from that. Of course, there is a term, there is a, a reference point within which you could say that is acceptable. And then when you look in Semitic languages, even in Arabic, similarly if you look in ancient Hebrew, you'll find this the same. The word son does not mean, it, it has a meaning that is not exactly how we understand son. For example, you probably heard, you probably remember when Saddam was being attacked and he said this is the mother of all battles. Yeah? So that this is a term that is used mother, or for example, Abu. In Arabic, they term, use the term father, Abu of something. Now normally, I am the father of my son, so I am Abu Abdullah, so I'm the father of Abdullah, Abdullah is my elder son, so my kunya, as they call it, is Abu Abdullah, I'm the father of Abdullah, Abu Hanifa, Abu such and such, Abu Malik, Abu whatever, right? Okay, so you could be, this is one of the ways of the terms of reference. But sometimes you're nicknamed after something that you're particularly fond of. For example, you might look, there was one of the Prophet Muhammad's companions who was called Abu Huraira, which means the father of the kittens. Now, it doesn't literally mean that Abu Huraira stuff for Allah, you know, had, you know, had fathered kittens, yeah? It means in Arabic that he, but why? Because if you know the story, he was very, very fond of cats. So it was a nickname he was given, Abu Huraira, father of the cats. And this is the term that the Sem Semitic languages use it. So if it was ever used, it means that is something you are fond of, something you are connected to, something, so it has a purely symbolic meaning that it should not be given any type of literal understanding to avoid. But however, some scholars have said this is why in the Quran this term is not used. Although it seems almost definite that it was used in the past, but it is not used in the Quran. In fact, you can
could say it is prohibited from being used. Why? Because it is an avenue that leads to worshipping something other than God. And this is something you'll find in Islam. Islam is not a religion that is only saying, don't do this and don't do that. <coughs> yes, don't commit these sins, don't commit these evil things. But the Quran doesn't just say, don't do it. It says, don't even go near it. Don't go near the things that might lead you to commit that thing. So this is an important theme we find in the religion of Islam, that it is seeking not only to keep human beings away from those things that are detrimental for them, spiritually and socially and individually, but it is also trying to keep them away from even the things that would lead them to that. So similarly, this is why some things are prohibited in Islam, that are avenues, they are potential avenues that could lead people to disobey God or to worship someone or something other than God. So the prophets of God are therefore human beings. Now there is an important reason why the messengers are human. And that is because the messengers are not, they're not just postmen. It's not like, you know, you know, knock knock, here's the Quran, right, here's the Injil, here's the Torah, and that's it, I'm off now. You know, you make up your mind what's in it. No. They're not postmen. The messengers are living examples. And that is why they need to be human. Because if the messengers were semi-divine beings or, you know, something else, then we would have many excuses. Even though, for example, the Quran mentions that the pagan Arabs were saying to Prophet Muhammad, why doesn't Allah send an angel down to us? But the point is here, is that you are a human, and you need as your example a human. Otherwise you would say, if there was an angel, we would say, you're an angel. It's very easy for you to say that. It's very easy for you to say, you know, uh, you know uh, don't go out with that girl, and don't drink that alcohol, and don't take those drugs, and don't do this, and don't do that, because you're an angel. You don't have the desires that I have. You don't have the needs that I have. Very easy for you. It becomes an excuse. But if the messenger is human and the messenger lives the message, practices practically the message, it means that it is an example for us that we can follow. Therefore, the messengers are not only people who have delivered a message and bought a book, they are the living examples of how we can implement that message. And that is why their humanity in that respect is very important. So it is a message for humans that is lived by a human. But, of course, the messengers, as we believe, are the people of the highest moral caliber. They are of the highest moral caliber. They have been chosen by God because their hearts are pure, because their character is good, because they are truthful and they are honest and they are trustworthy. And therefore, they are the sort of people that you would accept that message from. So in a sense, the life of the messenger is in itself a type of proof of the veracity or the truthfulness of the message. The Quran alludes to that, alludes to the fact that the Prophet Muhammad lived with these people. They knew him, they knew his character. And in fact, we find in the life history of the Prophet that the first time Prophet Muhammad actually went to his people and preached to them openly, he made them testify to his truthfulness. He stood on the top of Mount Safa, which is a like a hill outside, well, on the edge of, 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 the, of the mosque in Mecca. And he stood up there and he called the people. He called the tribes and he said, Oh my people, if I was to tell you that there is an army about to invade us from, from behind this hill, would you believe me? They said, Muhammad, we never heard anything but truth from you. Of course we believe you. So they testified collectively, his people, to his truthfulness. In fact, even before he was calling the people to believe in one God and to submit to God and to obey God's guidance, they 